right. Welcome, welcome. Good morning, good morning. And we're happy to have you back with us at Whispering Hope's Daily Sabbath School Lesson. We are studying this week, we're studying Joseph, Master of Dreams, and today's topic is Family Troubles. Before we go into our discussion with Elder Jarvis this morning, we are going to bow heads as we ask Elder Jarvis to invite God's presence in our midst. Let us pray. Loving Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity where we can come before your presence, looking into your word. Pray, dear God, at this time that you may give us of your spirit, give us unction from on high. Pray, dear God, that you may lead our thoughts, lead our tongues, and you alone may be glorified. May we exalt you because you are worthy. And may this day's lesson be a blessing to us. May we find clarity. May we find peace in your salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Our memory text for this week comes from Genesis 37, verse 19, and it says, Then they said to one another, Look, this dreamer is coming. So, Elder Jarvis, it's just you, you alone, holding down the fort for us this morning. So we're just going to go right into our topic. We are discussing Joseph, as he said before, and we're going to study about some of the issues that he had. So before we go into our discussion, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 37, verses 1 to 11. And Jarvis will read that for us, and he's going to tell us what family dynamic predisposed Joseph's brothers to hate him so much. All right, Genesis 37, 1 to 11 reads, I'm reading from the King James Version, it says, and Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock of, with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, but he was the, because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat. Their father loved him more than all his brethren. They hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed the dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here, I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed. For, behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and, lo, my sheave arose, and also stood upright. And, behold, your sheaves stood round about, and made obeisance to my sheaves. And his brethren said unto him, Shall thou indeed reign over us? Or shall thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet more, yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it to his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and Eve and eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. Well, I, I am very keen when it comes to the peculiarities of family dynamics. And, you know, for a, a lot of years, I too had experienced some difficulties in the same regard. And uh, I am able to be sensitive with the whole concept. If we look at the issue with Jacob and his children, here we find Jacob was in Laban's house 
loved Rachel, and Laban tricked him and gave him Leah. Now, Leah was fruitful, so she began having children. However, Jacob's at full attention was upon Rebecca, and Leah struggled. Even though she had all these boys, she struggled to get Jacob's attention. And with her struggle came the struggle for her sons as well. So they were apparently overlooked in the mix of the, 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 the tug of war for attention of their father between his two sister wives. Now, when Leah came to a place, she gave her maiden to her husband and also Rachel did the same. And these two, these two servant girls had sons as well. Imagine if Rachel was, had Jacob's full attention, Leah was struggling, how much less attention would these two handmaids get <laughs> from Jacob? So then, and naturally, because Jacob will have less attention for them, their children also will suffer. So here we have, three women having sons for this man who pay them little to no attention. And for the years as they grow and develop, the resentment, the ill feelings, the talking negatively toward him and in front of the children, how the, the play and counterplay of the twisted family structure continue to build brick by brick until here now we find that Rebecca finally gives him a son and he is a son of his old age as the Bible calls it and he loves this son because he is the fruit of his love and not being the wisest as Jacob was not being the wisest parent he openly showed his preference to Jacob. Now, that really was even a bigger stone on that hill of stones, mistakes that he has made over the years. Because not only were these other children feeling slighted, but now this little one comes and he is preferred above everybody else. So we need to look at the situation from the perspective of how these individuals were feeling, their personal thoughts and ideas, you know, how they were triggered by, you know, the preferential treatment of this youngest, younger brother, their younger sibling. And because their father loved him more and they knew that, their ill feeling towards him increased tremendously to the point where they want to kill him. And he's having dreams telling them that he would, well, suggesting to them that he is going to rule over them. He's going to be bigger than all of them. Now, human nature is unique <laughs> and interesting at times. And it is, it, this is just a magnification even though we know the end of the story, they, this is just a magnification of, you know, all of the issues of this sinful world and the inconsistencies in our behaviors, the very twisted ways that we show preferences and how persons respond in these times. You know, it, it, this really convoluted the family relationship and made it difficult and in, in a lot of degrees. And I hope that you know we'll be able to look at the story as it plays out. And even some of us may be able to identify with some of these things and recognize that you know there is a better way than just the one of fulfilling you know our personal feelings in certain circumstances. All right, great, great explanation. So we've established the reason what could cause what has caused Joseph's brothers to hate him. 
So we're going to look at Genesis 37, verse 3. I'll read it for you. And it says, Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. Now the question is, based on this text, why did Jacob love Joseph more than the other brothers? Well, I think I, I did suggest that. First of all, he was the son of his great love, Rebecca. I'm not sure if anywhere in scripture suggested that he loved Leah, nor any of the handmaids. But he loved Rachel. And now that she was able to conceive and bear him a son, and this son came after years of desiring for that to happen. He, I guess, he just felt this enormous amount of feeling toward Joseph because of who was his mother and you know how long she waited before she could have had this son. And you know, him, you know, being satisfied that. Finally, she gave me a son, not only a child, but a son. And all, all of his emotional entanglements, you know, were kin to Joseph and him being born. So really and truly, it was a, a serious error on his part to show that sort of preference. But I guess it's just our nature. And in the, the expression of our feelings, sometimes if we're not careful, especially in the family situation, we will inadvertently show favoritism, which doesn't help the family nucleus because it often you often set off grenades and dynamite it at the conspicuous and inconspicuous times, you know, and there is the whole notion of resentment between siblings when these things are occurring. But it's just the, the abundance of the feelings that he, he had because of the variables. Be Rebecca, his mother, now she has finally given a child when she had wanted a child for all these years, and him now receiving a son. When he was old, he really loved this child and showed that kind of love towards him. All right, so as we go on, we see here that Hebrew culture dictates, and we saw it with Jacob and Esau, that the birthright is usually given to the firstborn. Now, when we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 2, we find out that Joseph eventually receives the rights of the firstborn. So the question is, is this saying that Rachel has, was seen as the only wife of Jacob? <laughs> I have to be careful how to answer this. The if we look at if we look at the the, the passages, and I find I find the Bible to be peculiar in its expression, where we have in Genesis thirty seven that verse number two, the Bible called Bilha and Zilpha. Jacob's wives, right? And we know that Leah is what's called his wife as well. Now, Rebecca was the second wife in the numbering of things because he had Leah, he got Leah first. Was she the preferred or the real? Well, I'm not sure how to answer that. But the, the, the issue really was Jacob, and as we look at, continue to look at his story for this week, we'll see just like Jacob, well, Joseph, just like Jacob, had a desire for a relationship with this, this family things that the other sons didn't exhibit. And I believe 
it is because of this why God selected him who the great things in saving Israel in that time of drought and I know allow Joseph, Jacob, and the other family members to come to Egypt to save them so that they could be preserved so that the Messiah could come through the line because that's really the key. The promised seed would come through that line. And because of that, uh, well, I wouldn't suggest that Rebecca was preferred or she was the real wife, but it is just part of the children which God used in order to bring forth his promise. As we continue to look at this family dynamic, now, Joseph's brothers hated him so much they couldn't even engage in a peaceful conversation with him. And we see that in Genesis 37, verse 4. What are the dangers or disadvantages of showing favoritism in the family? Well, I don't know about you and your experience, but we there, there are times when parents inadvertently seem to show that, well, sometimes they do, and not in, inadvertently, they overtly show it. But there are some times when parents inadvertently display some preference towards one child over another. But it's a really dangerous practice because everyone wants to feel loved. Everyone wants to feel like they are the, the affection coming towards them is is just as strong as everyone else. Everyone wants to be included. They want to feel included. And whenever we choose to express ourselves more favorably to one than another, the, the impartiality will be seen. And usually it is not the parents, well, majorly it's not the parents who feels the wrath of a sibling, but it is felt one to another. Okay, yes, some persons well will develop resentment for their parents because of what they think the parents did to them. But the, the most times, sibling to sibling, the, the treatment, that they dish out to one another, especially to the one who is preferred. And in a situation like Joseph, when he had so many bro older brothers, you know, I'm sure he, he faced some difficult times. I can tell you that I have experienced a little bit of that. And I know that it doesn't feel good. It's not one of those things in which anybody really would prefer, well, would, would, would like to go through because you have to experience a lot of emotional, what should I call it? Um, a lot of emotional distress, especially when, you know, as I spoke about earlier, our desire to fit in, you know, all your siblings may make it difficult for you to be seen as one of them, to be included in the group and that sort of stuff and it, it's, some persons have real trouble throughout their lifetime dealing with those ill feelings and it, it, it translates into a lot of resentment and difficulty in the family structure these things really don't benefit anybody so i will encourage those of us who are parents you know do your best not to show that sort of favoritism for one child over another one because it really doesn't bear any good fruit in the end. You know, they, there's too much pain associated with that sort of activity. Yes, so we've established that nothing good comes from favoritism among children. So how can we avoid showing love for one child over another? So we know it's wrong, it shouldn't be done. How can we avoid doing it? Well, I can tell you, I can tell you that sometimes it's difficult. I have a, I have a concept that, you know, in every family, there's what we call a, a black sheep. And the reason being is just that there is always one child who, with whom the usual 
family guidelines don't fall so well with. It could be that that child possess, you know, they have a different love language. And what the parents have developed over the years and has worked with everyone else doesn't work for this particular child. And as Gary Chapman indicated with love languages for children, that as long as you're unable to speak the language of a child, they're not going to understand that they are loved, you know? And in that, they're going to feel as if, they're going to feel left out. They're going to feel as if my parents don't care about me. And they're going to respond in ways that are unfavorable. It may not be their full intention, but it is just that they feel left out. They feel as if everything is going well for everyone else and they are left by themselves. And in those times, we, many parents don't know how to deal with it because they speak a certain love language and they don't understand the other one, the, the one that the child is looking for, and they can't speak it. So instead of uh, a, a taking a position of seeking to understand what is missing, most parents just become more firm and stern and belligerent even and demand that the child come up to where they are or understand the language that they're speaking or, it, or else, you know. Uh, and it doesn't really work that well, work that well. For us as parents, we need to learn. Uh, we need to come out of ourselves many times and learn that there are things that we need to do. There was no manual that came with any child ever being born. None. So there is no textbook that you can fall back on to be chapter 17 to see what to do when a child doesn't feel loved. We have to learn something. We have to go out of our way sometimes to learn new material, to get it better equipped. And in turn, as we grow, we are able to do differently and to help our children in many respects because we are growing and they would be able to benefit from our growth. We're coming close to the end of our discussion. This morning, we're going to ask you to turn to Genesis 37, Genesis 37, verse 10. And you're going to read that for us. And you're going to tell us why, why did the lesson suggest that Jacob kept this in, incident in his mind, meditating on its meaning and waiting for its fulfillment? Then it says, 37, 10, it says, and he told it to his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, what is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? Now, <laughs> it is always, it is always interesting as you, as for a parent, as you watch your children develop and the varying character traits and personalities that they engender. To see that this young son, I don't think, well, it, it could be that they were just saying, because he's afraid with his behaving as if he's the boss, you know, and he's even now beginning to suggest that even his parents, are going to have to be obeying him at some point in time, probably. But I think that Joseph, Jacob was particularly concerned and he didn't dismiss it totally as foolishness, but he recognized that there could be something that this was really representing. This could have been you know, maybe God's direction, God's purpose. And so he tried not to forget it and kept the kept this dream in his heart and mind and watched to see how it would be fulfilled. But I'm sure 
it was shattered after he got them news when them, the boys sold him into slavery that Joseph was dead and all, all of that stuff went out the door. You know, but I, maybe it's likely that Jacob kept it in his heart just to, you know, see how life would turn out and where this would lead in what format it, it, it would manifest itself. We spoke about favoritism. We spoke about Joseph's hatred towards Joseph's brothers' hatred towards him, and so many other things, and how it applies to our life. So now you look back to our lesson. What is your takeaway from this lesson for this morning? Well, for me, we find in in, in the storyline of these individuals. We find a lot of interesting distortion. Distortion of our perceived concept of family structure and how it is supposed to be managed. What are the requirements of God? How does God even function in such dysfunction? Really and truly, the challenge for us is we have a glossy concept of the Bible. We look at it and we read it, but we, we spiritualize everything and ignore the realities of the stories. God wants us to know that there are some of us who may have found ourselves in situations like these or even worse. And if the, the Bible is there to express these nitty gritty details of family dysfunction so that we can see that even through this, these dysfunctions, God still is able to work out his perfect plan. And it is not for us to decide that because our situation and circumstance isn't perfect, because we didn't come from this perfect looking family or we, we didn't have this growing up or that growing up or we were uh, or we, we had a little bit more than everybody else or my, my brothers uh, were murderers or I have a sister who went to prison or uh, you know, so somebody was a drug addict or something of a sort. Not because these things happen means that any one of us are precluded from being accepted by God. He is still willing and able to save despite our history, despite the family that we are from despite the structure that we have in our, the corrupt structure that we have in our heads, despite we sh thus showing favoritism to one child over another and destroying one in the process, despite all of these errors and issues that humanity faced, God remains the same and he is still able to do for each and every one of us, messed up or not, he is still able to save all. And that really is my takeaway for this week's lesson. So we've come to the end of our study this morning. We're happy that you could have joined us as we go through the story of Joseph. And tomorrow we hope you will join us as we study Joseph Gets Attacked. And we hope that you're ready, that you have questions, that we can address at the end of this week. Hope to see you locked in early tomorrow morning. Have a great day and see you tomorrow.